thank you all very much for uh, the opportunity to talk about partnerships. Um, I'm extremely um, just humbled and, and really uh, happy to be able to, to be a part of this team. Uh, new member of the team, but have been thinking about these things for a long time. So today we're going to talk about partnerships. And many people will probably appreciate that um, one of the strengths of Protocol Labs is its ability to bring in community for all these aspects of development. So this is really about community development, but thinking about it in a couple of different dimensions. So first, a little bit of, of ba uh, my background to give you some context to where I'm coming from. Uh, based out of Atlanta, Georgia, here, you guys, the nice uh, Atlanta, Georgia skyline there. Uh, you can get, feel like you're there. You can smell the fried chicken almost. But no, but to give you a little bit of context and, and how I want to be able to help the project, um, started out with some full stack development at IBM, doing a lot of Java, database, front end work, sort of traditional consulting stuff. But then I was able to join the Hadoop ecosystem early on and I actually worked at a company that had a big problem around processing large data sets. And pre-cloud, pre-big data, this was a very expensive proposition. You'd have to spend millions of dollars to Oracle or to Teradata, or one of these organizations, and it was very difficult to scale to large data sets. Google was doing this very well, and they wrote a paper about how they were doing it. Yahoo um, implemented that paper, and that implementation became Apache Hadoop, effectively. Um, and throughout its life cycle and being able to, to work in that space, I was able to work with large organizations that had hundreds of nodes trying to implement Hadoop and, and see really the reasons why they were using it. Uh, very often it was Apache Hive running SQL on top of Hadoop for very standard SQL workloads. They wanted to be able to scale uh, to very large sizes. But it was also a great opportunity to see how the open source community worked. And it was a really fertile space because there was the growth of the open source community, there was the, the growth of the partner network, and I can tell you firsthand, having been a sales engineer in this space, that the partners were extremely important to our success uh, of the overall you know, Hadoop ecosystem as it, uh, as it grew. And then more recently, I was able to work in public cloud and see how and why people were making this big shift into the cloud and how that changed the data structures that they were using and how that changed the way they thought about processing and all these new tools that they had available. So I'll try to kind of color the conversation around some of those dimensions. Um, and then lastly, um, I was also very much involved in crypto for since about 2013 just purchasing and then mining for a time, but also I was able to work with some of the decentralized finance organizations more recently and get a good appreciation about how all that works. And, and that was really what led me to Protocol Labs because Protocol Labs brand is extremely strong in the crypto space. It's a foundational organization, and so I was very fortunate to be able to get connected to you guys. Um, so a little bit about me, we'll come back to this more in detail. Love being outdoors. I hate having to drink, stop drinking coffee at the end of the day. That's probably the worst part of, of my day um, because I do need to eventually get some sleep. Although now that I'm on a different time zone, maybe I'll just keep cranking the coffee. Um, so uh, partnership goals for Bacal Yao. Why do we want to have this, this partnership? So effectively, we do want this system that's going to work elegantly out of the box. Our engineering teams, from a product management perspective, we're going to work on that. But we want primitives that are really going to empower other organizations, and we'll give you guys some example of what those primitives are going to look like. We want it to be a robust ecosystem. You know, uh, Protocol Labs will have a strong place in it, but we want to give agency to these other uh, partners to feel like they have ownership and they can contribute. And there's various mechanisms and incentives that we'll go through in just a second. So let's put some KPIs to this, and let's say... We do need some referenceable partners that when we launch in October are going to stand up and say, we believe in the vision of Bacalyao, we are actively contributing and testing to this, and we want to be a part of this, this world. So we're setting a target for ourselves, five referenceable partners by October, um, and the goal is to blow that out of the water. But that's where we're going to start from. So let's go over a little bit of the landscape of partners because this will color a lot of the rest of the conversation here. The first type would be, let's say, contributors or users, folks who are just essentially consuming most of the product. They, they use it as an alternative to whatever they were using today. Maybe they're no longer using S3 and uh, Databricks hosted uh, cloud service. Now they're using Bacalyao as an example. Um, and we'll go through some, some examples of what different types of industries that might include. Uh, the second would be extenders, people who are going to actively contribute back into uh, the product and people that are going to roll up their sleeves and they're going to submit PRs to Bacalyao as an example. Um, these are people that will probably have some existing component tree and, and frameworks and they want to pr produce integrations into their existing frameworks with, uh, with Bacalyao. And David, stop me if I miss 
anything on the, uh, the characterization of these guys. The last one's very interesting, and I think this is especially something that Filecoin has done really well today, is embedders. People who are going to say, to the external world, just use our product as you normally do. Behind the scenes, you'll be benefiting from Back Yao on your processing. It'll get the, the benefits of openness, transparency, all the things that we love about what we're building for Back Yao. Uh, but those folks will be the UI. And that's really an especially interesting area because the user experience will be the same user experience as it was before. And there's a lot of like nice outcomes that we could have with that group of partners. All are welcome and really, all are critical for the project to be success. If we don't have this network of, of different types of partners, then we're probably making some design decisions wrong on the way in. So here's an example. Once we have these re referenceable partners, October 1st, there's gonna be press launches. We're gonna have you know, awareness that's gonna drive what's going on within Bakoyao. And these are some of the things that they're gonna say. They're gonna say, this has really transformed the way that people are using the data now. You know, previously the data was siloed, it was private, now it's open, it's public, it's forkable. These are some of the types of things that we're really proud of that Bakuyao is bringing to our projects. And also in terms of size and scope, because we don't want to just, uh, you know, this to be sort of toy projects. As was mentioned earlier, we're going to really push this and, you know, we're going to have failures along the way and, and we're going we're gonna to push it as, as far as we can to, to have some meaningful projects because we do want to see where, um, where the bugs are going to surface. And then lastly, from an operations perspective, our SRE team is going to work on other things uh, because this is an automated, managed, decentralized system that does not require full staff to maintain. So what does this profile look like of a good partner? Because not all partners are created equal. Some might be better in the future. Some might have different interests. But let's talk about the ones that are going to be good first round candidates. I have a couple ideas, but I'm very open to hear your guys' perspective on this as well. So the first one is someone that is at least philosophically aligned with the mission of Yao and Protocol Labs, championing open source. There are some organizations that are true champions because it's aligned with their philosophy and their business model. There are some that are very closed, some in the financial services industry, so they may not be that version of a good partner. Um, small and nimble, they can move fast, they can try new things, they have the staff to try new things, they have the ability to try new things. Some larger organizations don't have that flexibility. Um, maybe they're already using IPFS. The number of partners that are already leveraging Filecoin and IPFS, their ecosystem is very rich. They might be good candidates to start with. Um, uh, could benefit from a public partnership with Bako Yao. There are many organizations out there that have, and you know, coming from an enterprise perspective, they might have the perception of being older or less tech friendly or whatever reason. And, and, and there's very significant in, in intentions within the organizations to say, we want to be tech forward, we want to be progressive, we want to be in the cutting edge. And this type of partnership could be good proof for those organizations that they're wanting to get to, uh, at the edge of of this sort of decentralized technology. Valuing open and collaborative data sets and data analytics. This is one we'll give an example here in a minute of an organization like OpenAI. OpenAI has the word open in the name of their organization. However, some components, yes, exactly, some components of the organization are, are closed or proprietary for various reasons in their business model. So this gives them an opportunity to really kind of live what the meaning or the mission of their organization could be. Well, we did put together a couple examples just to kind of share, um, you know, on the similar, similar way of thinking, just some ideas of, of how we might slice this into different landscape. And we'll go through some more detailed examples here. We've got obviously some partners in the room, which we very much appreciate all of your guys' contribution. We've got uh, the user group, the extender group, the embedders. I'll go through each of these in a little bit more detail, just to talk about why they might be beneficial to the, to the mission of, of Bako Yao. And then also maybe one sort of side comment here is maybe systems integrators, because in the traditional enterprise world, you have these consulting organizations, maybe like Winder as an example, where they are very effective at, at doing the heavy lifting that these customers cannot do. And they, they have a, gr a great business that they run, and, and how do we incentivize these systems integrators to, um, to build profitable businesses, helping people run their workloads on Bakuyao? So talking about users, so this is an example where their mission is to uh, benefit humanity through uh, open AI research. And they came up with some incredible things recently, text generative stuff, but a lot of that has been maintained you know, privately. And even when the actual models are released, the data sets are not always made as available as folks might like. So if they were able to do more of their data engineering and more of their, their processing in a public manner, would that help them further their own mission? Um, and it would give us at least you know, some interesting data sets to hopefully very paralyzable workloads around 
um, sentiment analysis and those sorts of things. There's an organization named Audius, which they're sort of like an open source version of Spotify, um, IPFS-centric IPFS -centric today in terms of how they store their data, open source friendly. Uh, there's some workloads they have, which is running a content node, which is doing very, I would say, straightforward processing of audio files. Is that an embarrassingly parallelizable job? Might be. Could be a fun first workload to, to think about. Um, and then, obviously, there might be... Um, adjustments to the technology integration that would need to happen. So we have to think about that along the way. Chain analysis is also in some ways a public goods organization. They do a lot of the investigations that happen in crypto um, criminal investigations. There's heavy amounts of blockchain data to be analyzed to see where did transactions move. And so if you ever hear someone say, oh, we caught the people that were involved in a, in a crime around crypto, very often chain analysis is the one that's doing it for the, uh, for the federal agency. Um, and if you look at their data, they're heavy amounts of the, their, uh, their processing. And, and if they could make that information more public, does that further their mission to, uh, to help uh, investigate the crime? There's also some really interesting things thinking about social goods. A lot of people talked about social uh, media and the state of social media today and making it more friendly for society. And so there's a couple projects like Ave has the Lens Protocol. There's a startup named Deso, And their focus is around building, rebuilding these, these social media platforms so that the, data, the user owns the data. Those platforms will themselves also need tremendous amounts of analysis in order to be effective. You know, for example, an algorithm needs to be run to recommend content to you, just like Twitter does today. So if those systems are going to do processing on these public data sets, why not do those, that processing on Bacalhau, as an example? So. All right. So those are the users. Let's talk a little bit about some examples of extenders or people that we could use some, some extensions from. Um, you guys covered very well earlier in the last session how Jupyter and Python notebooks are sort of the lingua franca for a lot of data science uh, work that goes on today. So, you know, if we think about the existing Jupyter community, how difficult would it be for us to provide extensions so that I can have my existing work that I've written in an IPython notebook and have a very easy interface to just deploy it directly, the data sets or the workflows into, uh, into Bacalhau. Uh, Databricks, especially in the enterprise component here, um, Databricks is, has the most contributors to Apache Spark. Um, they're sort of an open core business model. Um, they do provide proprietary extensions in their own uh, cloud uh, uh, offering there. But the nice thing about an organization like Databricks is they have a very large footprint among the data science community, at least in particular the enterprise data science community. And so are there components where within the Databricks ecosystem, the Apache Spark jobs could be running on, um, uh, could be running on Bacalhau? Lots of work to do there. That might be sort of a future operation there, but this would be an example. And then Dask, you guys highlighted very well how Dask is a very popular Python-centric uh, scaling solution. Uh, what would it take to just take Dask, drop it in the back of the aisle, allow it to run in an extended fashion? Um, these are some fun things that would be interesting to get those, that team and that community involved to get their perspective on the architecture as it evolves. Um, and then in terms of embarrassingly um, scalable uh, projects, Scikit Image is an interesting one, very popular with the data science community, particularly for image processing. You think about things like Landsat and other simplistic jobs, maybe they would be a good place to start thinking about how we could integrate with those guys. And the last here are embedders, people that we want to wrap Bacalhau under the covers so that their users don't necessarily need to know Bacalhau is running it, but they get the benefits of the, of the openness and the transparency. Um, FileBase is an interesting one that uh, is working within IPFS today. Um, I believe FileBase um, had just recently extended some decentralized compute to a, a, a platform named Akash Networks um, because the S3 API itself does require some additional processing uh, for requests to translate that into direct reads. Um, now, Bacalhau seems like it could be a very interesting alternative to, to uh, Akash in that case. Simplistic, decentralized, the data is already native to IPFS. But this also actually in itself would be um, an enabler for the broader ecosystem because many data scientists are comfortable working with the S3 API. So there's multiple points of benefit with, uh, with an organization like that. And then also Fleek, uh, Protocol Labs has done very well to help um, partner with and support Fleek as an organization. Um, uh, you know, in particular, many web developers are coming from this Netlify, Vercel, GitHub world of, of deployment. Fleek has done a very good job of being the Web3 version there. 
So what could we do from back of Yale to give them the nice uh, decentralized backend infrastructure? Um, and actually, <laughs> my slides are a bit strong when I say seemingly dead internet computer, uh, computer ecosystem. In case anybody here is from Dfinity, I uh, do not I do not have enough information to make that claim. But anyways, let's just say that there's alter opportunity for alternatives for uh, other, other uh, compute uh, alternatives. Um, so systems integrators. So we talked a little bit about how systems integrators themselves have a business to run. Many of these organizations we want for users may not have the sophistication to deploy it themselves. And so when would be good to partner with an SI? Um, if we're going after an organization that already has a consultancy that they use for these net new data science projects, that's a very easy way to partner with the SI because they are the data science wing for the organization. Do they have a trusted relationship with this user group that we're going after? Um, there's opportunities for co-marketing within these groups here, so it's always good feedback as well. And to give you a bit of a, a sense of the landscape, at the highest level, there's sort of these global SIs, which are the sort of traditional big consultancies for enterprise. There's also a healthy group of sort of regional SIs. And there's a group of terms that we might refer to as boutique SIs, which are very more data science specific or Python specific, equally valuable uh, in, their, in their awareness, but they would be a great you know, point of feedback as we're deploying the system. All right, so we've talked about the type of partners that we want to partner with. A brief comment here on the go-to-market structure and how we would actually engage this partner community to make it as robust as possible. Um, and there's a few different methods that we can, we can think about for growing partners. Uh, one would be relationships, introductions. You can't discount the fact that everyone in this room has probably at least one relationship with a, with a, a partner, a potential partner, or they themselves are a potential partner. Um, so word of mouth is a great way to start. Direct outbound marketing is very effective through conference activity, grants, all sorts of different ways that you can, um, you can invest in awareness of what Bafo Yale is doing to actually bring in partners directly. And the last is just direct outreach, just prospecting directly and saying, hey, we know that we want, for example, Jupiter to be a partner of Bafo Yale, so we'll just get in touch with them directly, try to find the right people and spend time and invest uh, going after that. So let's say we've got our partners identified. What does a timeline look like to bring those partners online? If we group it in about a three month time frame, there's gonna be some initial vetting to make sure that the design that they have in mind is the same design that we have in mind. Everyone's aligned on how we'll frame the value of this new partnership. Um, there may be some gaps in the current technology, so we'll have a little bit of a fit gap analysis to understand the work to be done and when they can commit resources, when we should commit resources. We'll start working on it, and within 30 plus days, there'll be some point where the core initial development is ready, uh, and we can start testing and going through and bug fixing and making sure everything's nice and sharp. Um, there's also um, this ability to do co-marketing. So their organization is gonna benefit from uh, alignment with Bako Yao, we're gonna benefit, so how do we sort of both, is it blogs, is it webinars, is it videos on YouTube? Um, all different kinds of opportunities to, uh, to get awareness out there. And there's also gonna be things like documentation. There's some good bread and butter things to make sure the deployment goes effectively. Um, and then last, we'll initiate the marketing launches. We'll have quotes lined up. We're getting ready to launch. And then T0 day is the launch. And so we all have our material that goes out. Everyone's aware. And then on an ongoing basis, we continue to, uh, to invest in the partnership to make sure that people are aware and we grow the partnership over time. So we talked about a number of different mechanisms here to partner. Um, some of them are you know, traditional Web2 components. Uh, some of them are more Web3 friendly, hackathons, bounties, and grants. Um, and then eventually, there, you could have a much more robust partner program where they have a self-service portal, they have an incentive structure, partners could get you know, um, direct payment benefits from, uh, from their partnership. This is kind of common in the enterprise space. But, um, but there's a lot of different ways we can invest in the partner program. So in terms of defining success for a partner program, um, if we look back, let's say we go six months from October launch, and we look back and we say, was this partnership program a success? What are the, the dimensions that we'll use to judge whether or not it's a success? We definitely care about how many users, how many partners come on board. We also care about what's the volume of workload that those partners are contributing. Uh, did, maybe they built something that's nice and shiny, but that nice shiny object also actually contribute to real workloads that are running on the, uh, on the platform. 
Um, how many of those partners are willing to continue to co-market? So it's, it's an ongoing benefit for their, uh, their brand and the, the work they're doing on their project. And actually, how much storage is that contributing to the Filecoin network? Is it making a meaningful addition to the, uh, to the growth of how people are using uh, Filecoin? Uh, and then lastly, you know, there's a lot of good examples of, let's say, well-built out partner programs. So we're definitely not reinventing the wheel from scratch. Uh, we can draw inspiration along the way as we grow our footprint and, and our sort of uh, build out of the Bacco Yao project. So that is all. Thank you guys for letting me share some ideas on the, uh, on the partnership programs. That's all for now. Thank you guys.